you have heard of the Manning Cast, well, I would like to welcome you to the Gallo Cast. The Gallo Cast is two of the top brothers in compliance, Nick and Gio Gallo, talking compliance. In this podcast series, we bring them together for a free-form exploration of compliance topics. It's great insights brought to you from the co-CEOs of Compliance Line. Fun, witty, insightful, with a dash of the two brothers throughout. I know you'll enjoy the Gallo cast. The topics for this initial episode of the Gallo cast include return to the office, Moderna CFO lasts for one day, keeping culture positive during an acquisition, ESG and climate reporting, Howard Schultz goes on a listening tour, when should a startup put in a compliance program, did we learn anything during the pandemic to reduce useless meetings, what did the Ukrainian war mean for compliance, and what can top management do to talk the talk, all on this initial episode of The Gallo Cast. Welcome to the inaugural episode of the Gallo Cast. And for our first episode, we're actually recording live at Compliance Week 2022. So, Nick and Gio, welcome. What's up, Tom? This is so fun. Yeah, glad to be here, Tom. So, as you know, we're going to take some topics and get your thoughts on them. Uh, not hot takes necessarily, but uh, we'll see where it goes. They All might right. be hot sometimes. They might be. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, number one. Uh, and I'll ask you to draw on your experience as the uh, co-CEOs of Compliance Line, but also what are you hearing from your clients' customers in the industry on the question of return to office, work from home, or hybrid? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think um, this ha- the pendulum has swung probably a few times over the past couple of years, and um, you know uh, it, it's been interesting for me to see you know just at, at the start of 2022 some companies kind of going off of the you know what, we have to be hybrid or everyone's working from home. I think you're seeing some big companies leading the charge and saying, hey, you know what, we're done with this, the pandemic's over, everyone needs to come into the office. Um, I think across the economy, there's gonna obviously be a dispersion of some people, you know, going fully remote and all of that. Uh, But it seems like there's some momentum going in the direction of getting people back into the office, um, which obviously we'll see how that impacts, um, you know, retention and hiring and stuff like that. Um, But it's probably easier to run a compliance program when people are in the same place. I think it's, um, I think, um, I think we've kind of overcorrected and I've heard a lot of people talk about, oh, people are going to push back against it. I think it kind of depends on job type if you're gonna, if work from home uh, permanent can work or if a hybrid scenario um, is best. I think we've seen, or I've seen kind of firsthand that the people that are fully remote, it takes them a lot, a lot longer to ramp. Their ties to the company are a lot weaker. Um, all that tacit knowledge, they can't accumulate it as quickly. And I think they end up being less effective in general. I think for some roles, like maybe coding or things where there's not like a lot of collaboration necessary, um, you know, it could be easier. Um, but we've kind of moved to, at least on the teams that I'm, I'm over, kind of a bias toward uh, in-office or like predominantly uh, in-office with like a hybrid component. Um, you know, I had a friend, I think I told you about this, but I have a friend. So my first job out of school was um, doing kind of consulting work. We would travel a lot and be working late at the office. Um, and uh, my friend's daughter got a great job at, at McKenzie in, tw- uh, in 2020. And so she was working like 80 hours a week in her apartment. And I was just thinking like how much, how much worse of an experience she's had. Like yeah. how much extra did you learn being in the, in the, um, in the Goldman office 100 hours a week? Yeah, learn, learn a ton, chained to that <laughs> desk. <laughs> no, but it's very different doing a job like that, that, you know, you, you, you need to be, you know, I, I was talking to somebody about the, the concept of that kind of onboarding and that mentorship, and they've had their teams remote for the past two years, and they're like, we have these people on the team that I've seen them face-to-face twice or something, and normally you can come into the office and I say, hey, let's talk about this call that I just had, or uh, you know, let, let's talk quickly before this meeting, and when everyone's remote, it increases the barrier where you gotta say, okay, let me try to get these three people on a Zoom meeting and schedule that versus like just being able to catch up. Um, And I think that that has implications for a culture of compliance, right? We were talking yesterday about this idea of cultural momentum where if people are kind of 
bumping up against each other and running into each other in the hallway and things like that, you, you have a chance for the issues and the concepts that you're pushing into compliance to cross pollinate across people. Right. Um, and it just becomes a lot more one-to-one -one communication and a lot more transactional um, when you're partially or fully remote. All right, our next topic is probably one of the most embarrassing PR <laughs> disasters this is brutal. Uh, of 2022, and that's Moderna. Uh, and it's their CFO lasted one day. Uh, and the reason he lasted one day is it turns out in his prior job, he and uh, his uh, finance team were under investigation for accounting fraud. But Moderna claims they didn't know about it, and they couldn't have known about it. Uh, query, should they have known about it? But what I really wanted uh, to ask you about, uh, not so much the due diligence part of that, but he was there for one day and they paid him $700,000, which was his annual salary. Obviously, that resolved any sticky litigation issues. But what happens when a company makes that big a mistake and basically rewards the person who the mistake either made the mistake because he lied to them or uh, they made the mistake? So I was wondering, how do you uh, kind of assess the cultural impact of something like that on the employees. And if you want to talk about the due diligence, I'm happy to hear about that. Too. Yeah, I think the due, the due diligence part is, you know, kind of a question mark because could they have actually found out about it? I don't, I don't know. You know, I think they found out about it after he was hired, um, at which point his previous employer kind of made that, that information public. I think that's how it, it went down. So I don't know how they could have known about it it's not a good look for the culture, right? I mean, it's not a big impact to the company, right? 700K for Moderna, that's like a drop in the bucket. Um, I think the cultural cost is what, what a real killer is. I mean, there's probably a bunch of people in the company who don't think they're making enough money, or there's a, probably a bunch of people who are disengaged to some extent, and then they see their company, um, you know, pay some guy, some, some fraudster 700K, a full year salary, which is probably multiples of what they make, you know, given the level that, that he's at. Um, I don't know how they could have gotten out of it. It sounds like he negotiated a pretty good um, employment agreement and a, you know an employment package, uh, but I don't know how you walk that back as a company. I mean, you have to pay it. It's super public. It's a definite like egg on on their face culturally, um, but those impacts can have like really long ramifications. You know? Yeah. I, you know, I think you try to put a good spin on it and you say, well, we're going to pay what we need to because we're not going to have someone who committed fraud here. But then you probably I imagine you stop talking about it there because there's not a lot of other good things that you can say about, yeah, we hired this guy and we had to pay him a bunch of money. Um, you know, I, I think it's a, it, it's a tough, uh, it's a tough situation to be in. And obviously like, uh, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Right. So like, you know, if they could have avoided that or, you know, maybe they could talk about like, Hey, here's how we learn from that. So we don't do it again. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure, uh, there are a bunch of people around that who, you know, think that it's, unreasonable and uh, uh, I, I think it's it, it's hard to like spin that so that it's a cultural win but you got to kind of run through it yeah and I mean it's just such a sticky situation right like if this guy s says that he didn't do anything which I'm sure he does is it on him to have told the company I, mean, I guess like in sort of uber honesty he should have um, but yeah, he's probably not legally you... obligated to do it yeah. right like I, 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 I doubt they're gonna sue him for not telling them but I mean, also whether they think they should have told him or not, he's fired. So it's gonna yeah, matter. I mean, it's there's just like any way you look at it, it's like, and it's a bottle job by Moderna. Any way you look at it. So for our next topic, we're going to take up one that has been in the public eye as much as any other business story over the past few weeks, mm -hmm. and that's Elon Musk's. Uh, I'm not even sure what to call it now. Uh, dalliance with Twitter. It's, it uh, was right. definitely a dalliance. It's a dalliance. Uh, and I don't want to focus on Musk's conduct uh, because, uh, you know, you guys come from private equity. What I really wanted to focus on is what do you think the cultural impact is on the employees of the companies involved? Obviously, Twitter, uh, but also Tesla. And what does it mean when uh, an acquirer starts attacking the acquirer? <laughs> acquiring target uh, before he's acquired them. What does that do for morale? And how does, it, it looks like now it's not going to happen, but how does Twitter come back from this from a cultural perspective? Yeah, I think one big question is what do the different, what impact do the different parties want to have on the culture, right? Like when Musk was, you know, investing in the company and making this offer and stuff like that, um, 
the, my sense of it was he wanted to change some things about the company. So he may want to shake up the culture, right? And he's done, you know, he, uh, he's, you know, had a history of making kind of bold statements and actions at, at companies that he had. So he, you know, I think leaders and managers might want to kind of keep things calm and keep people engaged. He might want to, you know, uh, rattle the cages and shake the trees a little bit. Um, but I, you know, that, that's kind of where I would start on it is like, do you want everyone to be calm or do you want, you know, some people who don't like your direction to quit or something? Yeah. And I mean, look at Tesla, like people don't invest in Tesla because of the economics, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like they don't invest in Tesla because of, um, you know, fundamental, uh, analysis. They invest in it because of Elon Musk and the cult of personality that he is. And so there's probably a portion of people in, in Twitter that were like excited about him and the changes that they thought he would bring probably a bunch of people who can't stand him and think he's an egomaniac and thought the changes were going to be sort of detrimental to, um, you know, what's, what Twitter stood for. Um, so it's probably a mixed bag, but to your question, Tom, about like, you know, attacking a culture essentially before you buy it, I don't know how you sort of come back from that. I mean, if he went forward with, with the, um, with the acquisition, I'm sure he would have like weeded the garden and tried to, tried to build, build that in whatever uh, image he thought was what was appropriate. But with respect to like, if the deal doesn't happen, that shakeup inside, that cultural shakeup inside of Twitter is gonna be an interesting one to see how it kind of plays out. Because, you know, there was probably um, a bunch of people that, that were like in Bolden who didn't like the direction that Twitter was going. And then you're gonna see people sort of double back down on, you know, protecting the, you know, the sort of legacy culture that was, was in place. So I don't think the story is, is over. I'll be shocked if he does the acquisition at this point. Um, but I think the ramifications of like, uh, the ripple effect through that culture are, are really just starting. Like it'll be 12 months from now and we'll still be kind of seeing it play out, I think. Yeah. And I think it's in, interesting to look at this through different layers, right? Like if you're e Elon Musk and you're going to go through with the acquisition and you want to do it, I think, you know, to the question about keeping culture positive, I think you got to set a clear vision and say, hey, there's, you know, been a bunch of questions. I've, you know, sent some tweets. I've made some offers. Here's where we're actually going. Here's the mandate. Here's the vision. And then you let people align around that, right? And to Nick's point, some people might say, hey, I'm not, I'm not on board for that. That's not the software we were building or whatever. But I think setting that vision um, is going to at least, like, allow people to align behind something. Uh, but then it's interesting to think of that through the other layers of the organization, right? Because he's not the only like manager or leader there. Yeah. Someone's leading a team of engineers and someone's leading a team, uh, you know, uh, that, you know, monitors community standards or whatever, right? There are all these employees working there and someone's, you know, a mid-level or senior manager who's also getting tossed around by this and they need to keep their team engaged and hit their KPIs and get work done. Um, and I think that's, you know, a more challenging cultural question and, and, and challenge of trying to get your team and say, Hey, I know we wanted to do this, not sure where this is going, but Hey, let's focus on what we can focus on or something like that. You know, keeping culture positive in that, you know, maybe you get your team to focus on what you can have an impact on and say, Hey, you know what, I'll do my best to keep you informed and you'll know what I know or something. But, you know, I imagine that's tough being kind of that middle manager and you have to lead, but you don't really you know, have information or input on uh, the direction that you're going to end up leading. I think it was kind of sloppy, the whole thing. I mean, I think he's, uh, I don't know. Say I, think it. He, I, I just think he's <laughs> like, I just think he's a, he's like an egomaniac. And um, I think it was almost neg negligent, some of the things that like he was doing in the tweets that, that he would send. I mean, the guy can move markets with tweets. He knows that, of course. Um, yeah, he's and just that Dogecoin. kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that like rattling of the saber and stuff. Um, I don't think it was like, I don't think it, it was positive. I don't really know what the point of it was um, other than maybe to feed his own ego. But I guess you can tell how I, what I think about him. <laughs> so our next topic is uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission proposed rules on uh, re companies reporting climate change risk. And the uh, SEC came out with a three-part structure, scope one, scope two, scope three. And the rulemaking process is they have a 60-day comment period. They've now extended that comment period for a second 60-day period because so many comments were filed. Uh, my sense is that the SEC is going to have some rules around uh, climate change reporting. Uh, we don't know what the final uh, product will be yet. But if you were advising a company uh, to 
start to prepare, how would you help them think through um, getting ready, uh, even using the, the proposed rules in place, recognizing that's probably not going to get more extensive. It may cut back a little bit. So I think about it like you, the way that you'd make a painting, right? So you get your canvas and then you put the wash on it and you start really blocking out the colors and you start blocking out what you're going to be painting. And then over time, you refine that with more and more detail and a finer and finer brush. We don't know what that final picture is going to look like, but we have some kind of sense of the landscape that we're going to be painting, right? We have, they've indicated, I mean, you can just kind of infer what direction these things are going to go. So you can just start getting your sort of your canvas in order right now, getting your brushes out. I can keep going with this analogy, I guess. Um, yeah, maybe get a little water. <laughs> <laughs> get your palette. Um, so those things, I think you can just start start kind of thinking about. And like they may extend it for another discussion period or a comment period or um, whatever. But it's coming down the pike for sure. You know, it's you know there's going to be something in place two years from now or something like that. So what can you do to kind of get out ahead of it? Um, and just again, like anticipate the direction that it, that it's that it's going to go. So that once that final ink is dried on the page, you're not sort of starting from scratch. Because that that's where I always see, like, people, I mean, we've all seen this, right? Like, that's where you always see someone, you know, get out over their skis when they're scrambling and they're, like, in reactionary mode because it's like, okay, now it's final. Well, you kind of have some idea of the direction it's going before it gets finalized. Yeah, and I think part of what Nick is talking about is this framework I really like called the ABZ framework, right? Like, we don't know exactly what Z is going to be, right? We don't know what the next... 26 series of decisions and mandates are going to be, but we can take step B, right? We're at A and we've done nothing on climate reporting and well, we need to, t you know, what's the next step? Well, one of those steps might be, well, let's figure out where, who's responsible for this? Who's the RP for it? Where, you know, where is this going to um, yeah. fall under? Is, it, is this part of financial reporting? Is this part of, you know, your audit team? Is it part of compliance? Is it part of legal? Um, and, you know, give someone a mandate. Maybe that's where you start. Maybe you start with the committee and say, I'm going to get all those people in a room and start figuring it out. But figure out, you know, you know, name a leader or figure out some structure behind that. And then, you know, I think you can, to Nick's point, infer something from, you know, scope one and get started on that and, and start doing some work on it. But I think getting ahead of it is going to not only like help you be prepared when it gets there, but it's also going to lower the like concern and the nerves and the potential for disruption later where you say, okay, well, obviously we're not fully done implementing all the reporting that we're going to need to have to have it perfect in 10 years, but we're working on it and it's moving forward. Um, and it's going to, you know, <laughs> if nothing else, keep people from constantly asking the question, hey, what are we going to do about that when it gets finalized? Exactly. Um, you know, I, I tend to think that getting to work on it um, and taking that uh, first step in uh, a journey of a thousand miles uh, is a good way to go. I love it. So Howard Schultz has returned uh, at, to the CEO position at mm -hmm. Starbucks. And one of the things he has done since he got back uh, is go on a listening tour. And uh, I first bumped into that term about 10 years ago, and I thought it was a fabulous idea. And uh, he's uh, so I really wanted to get you guys thoughts on not simply the listening tour, but listening mm. and the need for listening. And I know you've talked about that. Uh, what's the role of a leader in listening and why is that so important? And why at this point does Starbucks need the leaders to listen to their employees? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, I love that ang the angle that you're taking with the time of like, as leaders, we need to listen, I think. Um, you know, if you look at courses in an MBA program or, uh, you know, leadership books, a lot of them are about strategy and decision making and influencing people and telling them things and giving directives and making a plan and all of that stuff, which obviously is part of it. Um, but so, you know, I think it's endemic to the human experience and it's also becoming more and more prevalent and important in our modern culture that leaders need to be empathetic. You need to understand who you're leading. This command and control type of culture where, you know, uh, yours is not the reason why and I'll give you your opinion uh, or I'll, uh, if I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. Uh, like fewer and fewer organizations are gonna survive with that type of mindset um, and approach and it's important for leaders if nothing else, if you think this is like crazy and you know everyone just needs to listen because I'm the boss, if nothing else, just know that listening and making people feel like they're being heard is going to make it easier for you to implement the program that you know quote unquote you've already decided to do. 
that being said, the uh, you know the higher actualization of this is where, as a leader, you your plan changes and adapts based on the things that that you hear. And I you know I think there's a risk going on a listening tour um, of it being kind of like some sort of greenwashing and being you know the type of thing where you make a big statement and there's no follow through on it. Um, I tend to think personally that there's not that big of a risk in this situation. Um, I think some other leaders might fall into that. I think Howard Schultz um, has a pretty strong track record of leading through these types of changes. I admire his uh, leadership style and what he's been able to accomplish. And I imagine that he's going to you know, make, uh, make something good out of this listening tour. Um, but it does present that risk that, hey, all these people said all of this stuff and you know no, nothing's going to happen from it. Um, I think that's something that keeps some leaders out of it, Nick, is they say, well, I'm going to ask people all these questions, and then they're going to expect me to do something about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, the number one thing I think we want from our jobs is like a sense of belonging and a sense of purpose, and you can't have that if you are just being talked at. So you have to understand how things have changed as a leader. You have to understand what people are saying and you have to let them know that you're listening. Like there's active listening on a sort of micro level when we're having a conversation and you feel like I'm tuned in and there's sort of like macro active listening from an organizational perspective. People feel like their voices are being heard and people should not be shocked when they have massive turnover rates and massive quit rates in the face of the great resignation because people are taking advantage of and of the opportunities that are in front of them and they're not gonna stand for it anymore. Like how much, you know, how much browner could the grass on the other side of the fence be if you don't feel like you have a voice? You know what I'm saying? So I love it. Um, I hope this is gonna be one of those stories like um, when um, Steve Jobs took, took over Apple again. I have a feeling it's gonna be a similar type of thing. And it's kind of interesting to see how um, like the special sauce of an organization that even is, is as McDonaldized, so to speak, as Starbucks is, can still sort of dissipate and like evaporate away when when a leadership when leadership changes like there's a reason that he's stepping back into it and there's and he's a pretty smart guy there's a reason why this is the first step that he's doing is going going and doing this this listening tour so i think it's a super positive step forward and i think we can all whether on your on our like individual teams or just like corp, sort of corporately we can like take a note from this from this angle because it's super powerful and um it's just the way to the way to treat people like people you know so one of the questions I'm asked periodically is when should a new company, a startup, uh, put internal controls in place that would satisfy uh, SOX 404? I wanted to turn that a little bit and ask you guys, when should a new company, a startup, or other organization put a hotline in place? Yeah, I think once you're settling lawsuits for above a million dollars each on average, you should probably start putting a compliance program in place. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. Once you have a heart attack is when you should start worrying about your health. Yeah, um, right. I don't know. I think, you know, the sooner the better. I mean, you can get, you know, if, if you don't want to spend the money on a hotline, I don't know. I mean, most startups, they have, I mean, these are not that expensive. So um, just having that as a starting point, I think, is easier to grow with the company than trying to implement it later when you're doing your eighth round of fundraising and stuff like that. So, I mean, you know, people get their website set up right away. They get their... Um, you know, they get their logo built, they get all these other things built. This, you know, I think this should be sort of part of the startup package, um, especially because, you know, if you're gonna be a legitimate startup and you're gonna be attracting talent, and the thing that, that attracts, what, what attracts people to a startup? It's not just like the equity, it's being part of something that's alive and real and that, you know, is new and that there's a purpose in it and it resonates with their own purpose and all those kinds of things. Part and parcel with all of that, a component of it all, is kind of having a voice in an, in an organization. And I just always think like, when we came into our company, it was really small. And even then it was a lot of work to like change the culture and push that in a new direction. When you wanna try to change that culture when you're you know as big as we are now, it would have been way harder. Oh, it's sure. way easier to like grow with it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, to set that on the right direction, right? Like if you're growing a tree and for three years it's growing on a slant toward your house and then you wanna try to get it uh, pointed in the right direction that that's, you know, uh, that's going to take you off course. I was obviously being facetious with my first answer, but I think that, you know, again, to go back to that ABZ framework, get started on it quickly. You probably don't, you know, uh, people can disagree with me if they want, but if you're a solopreneur, 
sitting uh, at your kitchen table just trying to launch your blog, you probably don't need a formal compliance program and a code of conduct. But I don't know, in your first year, by the time you're at five or 10 employees, you can put some basic stuff in place, right? You don't need to be spending $80,000 a year on a risk assessment, but you can set up a way for people to report things anonymously. You can set up policies, you can set up training, code of conduct and start there. And you know, I think part of it is setting leadership around it and naming right. someone as a compliance officer, even if it's just once a quarter, let's review our key risks and see if we should add something to our program. It doesn't need to be something that, you know, keeps you from growing, you know, slows your growth down 20%, yeah, right. Silly. Um, but getting a framework in place so that, you know, right? If you're a startup and you hope that, you know, two years from now, I hope we have 2000 employees. Well, don't wait until you get there, have it in place so that as you scale up and add employees or something, there's some framework to, to fit it into. And then hopefully, uh, you know, you don't uh, en end up growing past where you were, where you were when you felt like you were too small for a compliance program. And then not only do you need to build a compliance program, but you have to undo a bunch of things that you've let go and you know, you uh, end up a Theranos. So the something. answer is immediately. I mean, think about like the moral hazard that comes along with a startup. Like you're running so fast, things aren't, aren't formed right. It's very easy for something to break and just like the wheel fly off the car. If people don't, and then particularly when they're small, if you don't have like a third party that's going to be that that Chinese wall between identification or you know at least offer anonymity. There's so much stuff that gets left unsaid that can you know again to Geo's point create a true culture of non-compliance when you're at a you know a billion dollar valuation or whatever that unicorn level is. Yeah, and I think um, I think it's on people other than the founders of startups to uh, make that easier, right? If you're an angel investor or you're a VC fund, right? Like there are more and more private equity funds are concerned with compliance. More and more pension funds, uh, you know, are interested in investing in ESG companies. Um, if you have influence around a startup company, um, you should be pushing this and say, hey, you know what, we need some governance in place uh, yeah. because the way that people are treated and the direction of this company and looking out for risk is in my own interest as, you know, a financial sponsor or as an advisor right. or a board member. Um, and at Compliance Line, we're working on a concept that uh, we're hoping to launch within the next year called Compliance in a Box. That's going to make it a lot easier for someone to kind of flip a switch, get some of this stuff in place, and at least get a toehold um, in some of these key pillars of compliance. And then it can grow with them and they can grow from there. It doesn't need to cost 400 grand a year for you to put a compliance program in place. You could do it in four hours. When were you going to tell me about that idea? Uh, I just did. <laughs> <laughs> And we are live, as we just discovered. <laughs> so um, I haven't worked in the corporate world for a long time, but when I did, the biggest bane in my existence was useless meetings. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And do you, do you think we learned anything in the pandemic to help reduce useless meetings? I don't know. I think it's like it, it might be worse than ever. Yeah. I mean, part, part of what I was saying with the work from home thing is like now, you know, if you're in office, you could pop by and ask somebody a quick question. Uh, now it's like everything's a Zoom meeting. So, hey, you know, do you have 15 minutes to hop on a Zoom later? It's like everything's like a scheduled meeting. Um, so I guess those in and of themselves are not useless kind of by definition because you're covering something in particular. But that cadence of getting together, I mean, I found it myself on some of my teams where like we're meeting and I'm just like, these meetings are too long. So we've started to try to cut them down. Um, we've tried to be a little bit more like fluid on saying like, do we need to actually meet? Um, and it's forced so the answer I think is no I think it's made us for, it, at least for us it's made us um, be a little bit more diligent on like okay we need to have an actual agenda if there's not an agenda we shouldn't have a meeting if there's no decision to be made then this meeting could probably be an email um, but it's easy to just fall into that and especially again from this like where you know um, the workforce is sort of all over the place you do kind of want to connect with people and you do want to at least see people on the screen so I don't know it's we have not figured it out but it feels like there's more meetings now than ever yeah, I think some some companies have figured some things out about it, right? Some companies have said, whatever, we used to have this all hands meeting for two hours every week and, you know, people didn't like it and we can cover all of that in a half hour and the rest can be asynchronous, right? We're going to send around an update or do breakouts or something like that. I think some companies have figured some things out um, in this, you know, remote uh, Zoom world that we're in, but, you know, to Nick's point, there have been countervailing forces that have made it worse. Zoom fatigue, you know, a yeah. bunch of people sitting on the screen, not really paying attention, not on camera, 
doing something else and you know miss something in the meeting because it's not an engaging meeting. Um, so I think there's, my guess would be that, like I said, some, some companies have made some improvements, but net net, I feel like it's probably, the meeting thing is probably more challenging like on balance now than it was three years ago. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the Ukraine war, to my surprise, it was not discussed at Compliance Week literally at all. Yeah, right. And I thought somebody would have at least brought it up on a panel. So I wanted to ask you for maybe one or two things you think the Russian invasion of Ukraine has meant for compliance. Well, I, you know, I think you can win any, any pot in a poker game with any hand that's dealt. And so I think what it's meant for compliance, I think for the smart compliance leaders, they've been able to use it as an opportunity to like expand their influence, expand their program, at least from a, persu or a persuasion perspective, um, particularly for those who have like international um, operations. So um, we have some friends who, you know, they were just bombarded with trying to deal with all these sanctions because they had international operations kind of in Europe and, you know, how, how to navigate that. and. The ones that had kind of good programs in place that were sort of prepared were much, they could sort of navigate through that a lot quicker and a lot easier, a lot, a lot more effic efficiently um, than those who were kind of caught back on their heels. So, um, you know, that guy, uh, Kenneth Polite, am I saying it right? Um, he was speaking yesterday, which I thought was super uh, insightful. He was the assistant um, district attorney for the DOJ's criminal division, and he was a former com chief compliance officer. And the thing that kept resonating with me is, you know, he, well, what he was saying was like, everybody's asking for more guidance. And he's like, I can't give you more guidance. But then he just went on to share a bunch of principles, which I thought were probably the most helpful, insightful things that I've heard with respect to like, what's the mind of the DOJ? What they kept talking about is like, is your program properly resourced? And does it have sort of um, like tripwires that are tripwires along with like a feedback loop to make sure that, you know, wrongdoing is identified quickly and then curtailed immediately. And I think if we can marry this thing, this sort of like exogenous, you know, invasion that nobody can control and nobody could see coming with this other, you know, with this sort of guidance from, from the DOJ, that creates a really interesting sort of persuasion path for someone to go to their board of directors along with a couple of data points and say, listen, we're not properly resourced. If something like this happened in a jurisdiction that we're in, I can tell you we'd be massively on our heels and there would be a massive you know, risk exposure that we would not be able to handle where we're at right now. So you know, I just think it's a reminder that like, the more things change, whatever, what's that saying? more things change or change is constant or something like ch change is always coming you can't see a freaking invasion happen like a year and a half ago nobody thought that that was going to happen but the companies that are prepared for it and um can be more more nimble are the ones that are able to navigate through it more quickly yeah um and you know i think there's a supply chain angle here there's a commercial interest angle that compliance should definitely be leveraging and there's that point that nick was just talking about about being nimble so obviously there's a supply chain, third-party risk management um, angle that compliance should be learning from about this. Mm -hmm. Of you know, are you know, do do we have key employees or key dependencies um, or key third parties that would be in, um, uh, impacted by a disruption like this? Again, you're probably not predicting that three years before the invasion of the Ukraine, but at least knowing what that is so you can react to it. That's something that compliance should be learning from this. I think there's a commercial interest angle of it. Um, for example, our company was evaluating a vendor, I won't name them, but uh, we considered not adopting this vendor because they had significant employee base in the Ukraine that we thought might disrupt their ability to provide and support right. service That's for right. us. So compliance can be leveraging that. You know, We were having this, this ROI conversation uh, yesterday at the conference here in DC. They can leverage that and say, hey, if you empower us more, if you resource us more, we're not going, we're going to be able to help the company adapt and predict these things right. so that we're, so that our, the commercial interest, right, like some tie to revenue is not uh, impacted or hampered by the next time something like this happens, right? This is probably not the last global conflict that's going to happen like this, unfortunately. Um, and then, you know, the last point is just um, we need to learn from this that our 
compliance programs need to be anti-fragile. They need to be nimble. They need mm -hmm. to be able to take a hit like this or take a disruption and quickly, right? Like within a matter of days or weeks, not months and years, adapt and say, hey, here's what we learned from it. Here's a postmortem. Here's how we're adapting to it. And here's how we're going to make sure that the next round is less disruptive for compliance and the company. Um, you know, that... Uh, that any of those could be lessons that somebody can say, hey, you know what, this is going on our quarterly or an, our annual roadmap so that we can get better based yeah, on yeah. this. Yeah, that's good. So we're gonna go to our last topic, which is what management can do to really demonstrate their commitment to compliance. So years ago, it started <clears throat> as sending out an email. Then it became signing the code of conduct or the compliance program statement of purpose. Then it became, uh, well, we'll do an annual video where, what have you seen some of your clients do that you thought was innovative in terms of how management, and I mean the really top leadership, got the message of compliance out to the troops? Um, you know, some of those things that you just mentioned, I think are basic and people do, and I think that those are great. Um, I think at some level it's kind of incumbent on the ethics and compliance team to get that from leaders. I think most leaders, if asked, will probably do that kind of stuff, whether it's a TikTok video or a, just like a selfie video uh, reinforcing, you know, something that's a little bit less formal. I think some of the authenticity that, that can come along with some of those those things I just meant, mentioned can be um, even more powerful. We have a friend, though, who um, what she's done is actually leverage more local leadership in concert with those sort of high level folks to reinforce those those messages, because sometimes you have a company where you know, someone could be on the elevator with the CEO and they don't know who that CEO is. So I think if you can kind of do a both, uh, you know, do do sort of both, both of those angles, that could be more, um, more like impactful, you know. Um, but talking the talk, I think it goes beyond, you know, I think it goes beyond them, you know, getting the CEO or the CFO or the chief, whatever, um, to say take this compliance training or we have a culture of integrity and stuff like that, I think it ends up playing out in what the company prioritizes kind of on a macro level. Um, I was talking to somebody at this conference and she was like, you know, I'm looking at going to another organization, like a healthcare organization where it's really about patients and it's not just about the dollars. And I said, oh, do you think that's really what's going on? And she was like, oh, absolutely. So people can boil down and see through the fog and see what, what's, what the company actually prioritizes despite the list of values that are on the web page, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. no one's web page has money at the top of it. They always <laughs> have these like altruistic, you know, you know, really nice values and stuff like that. But sometimes those actions those actions speak a lot louder than the words that are gonna come across uh, you know, a thirty second video or a, a nice email from, you know, the desk of the CEO saying, you know, we are committed to a culture of integrity. Yeah. Um I really like uh not to not answer the question, but I really like instead of trying to double and triple down on getting your CEO to make more statements about your compliance program, work. I think a lot of companies have a lot of headroom, a lot of room to grow in that mood at the middle and mm. that those local managers becoming ambassadors for a compliance program because you know, we, we see it when we're talking about yeah. resignations and quit rates. People very rarely quit because of how the CEO acts compared to how frequently they quit to based on how their manager acts. Yeah, that's a good like point. their direct manager, maybe the person one or two steps above that manager, right? They they see that person who's the VP and they're like, well, that's that's really my boss. That's the person setting the direction for my department. That's, you know, choosing what raises people get and things like that. I think those people have a lot more influence to change the way that the average employee sees a compliance program. So um, I, I think that, you know, if you're getting the, you know, annual statement video and, you know, in, uh, him endorsing the code of conduct or, you know, her, uh, you know, congratulating your compliance program right. uh, as the CEO, um, you know, I, I think that maybe instead of going deeper on that and getting five more of those, try to get some mood at the middle going. That said, if you want to engage your senior leadership more, um, I would, or if you're a senior leader and you want to be more engaged in building a culture of integrity, I would suggest that you help your compliance team by translating the things that they're doing into the language that you normally speak to employees. There, there, there's some sort of uh, language barrier, so to speak, between 
how compliance sees things and how an ethics expert is focused on regulation and you know uh, legal pronouncements and things like that that doesn't always kind of land in the ears of the employees. Well, the CEO is probably pretty good at speaking to employees, getting a vision set, yeah, right. and figure out ways to translate the mandate and the priorities of the compliance team into the language that you as the CEO know that people understand how, how you can talk about, hey, here's where we're going over the next two months and two years and 20 years, and this is why compliance is important to it. I think that interpretation, more than just kind of reading the script that the compliance team gives you, that interpretation and infusing that into messages that you give, I think can go a long way. Yeah, and I, you know, there seems to be this sense of like, you know, compliance needs to get the, the leadership to talk down to, you know, to speak to all the other employees. I think the um, compliance, or I think, you know, senior leadership should be pushing a culture of com com compliance to that next layer of, of leaders as well. And the way that they can really talk the talk, I mean, here's an idea. If, if retaliation is, is an issue, firing somebody who, firing a, a, a divisional leader if there's any retaliation in their division. <laughs> That's something a CEO can do to, to really talk to talk and put his money, money where his mouth is and say, we have no, no you know, tolerance for something like this. Um, pushing down to the folks that that you can that they can control, quote unquote, is I think a lot more effective if that's done effectively than just like sending out some mass communication to all the all the frontline folks that don't have any kind of relationship or any kind of you know that that the level of agency that that leader has with them is just a lot lower. Yeah, it's kind of a thesis you know that's based in a very command and control culture, which I think fewer and fewer companies yeah, are like right. performing well in, right? Okay, well get the CEO to say this thing and 30,000 employees are gonna start marching to it. Um, you know, I think cultures are becoming increasingly more localized and um, you're, there, there's probably some natural limit to how many times a CEO can say something and everyone says, okay, well, I guess, I, I guess I'm gonna uh, really pay attention during my annual training now. And you know what? It's way more visible if a CEO fires a director of operations because of their bad behavior in a very public way. That's way more visible and way more of a reinforcement to the culture that we're all, we're all supposed to be pursuing than some frontline worker who's you know, fired by some divisional leader. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Those are the things, those are the, those are the you know, your, your culture is just a bunch of endorsements and rejections, you know, things that are celebrated and things that are, are, are you know, thrown away and not tolerated. So we have to be able to, to like paint with both of those kinds of colors. And um, yeah, I think that's, um, that's my answer. <laughs> well, gents, this has been a great first episode and I look forward to continuing this discussion. Thanks Love for it. having us, Tom. Great thanks idea, to, Tom. Th thanks for everyone, everyone in the audience for listening. Catch you next time. This is Tom Fox. I hope you've enjoyed this inaugural episode of the Gallo Cast. Bring the link to Nick and Gio's profiles and LinkedIn in the show notes as well as Compliance Line. If you want to look at the top hotline provider in compliance as well as other compliance related services, check out Compliance Line. I hope you will join us next month for another episode of the Gallo Cast. GalloCast is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.